السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آئی ایم شاہدہ عمر یور ہوسٹ آن ہیلتھ میٹرس ٹوڈے آئی ایم اے ریپرزینٹیو اینڈ اے ممبر آف دی اسلامک میڈیکل ایسوسیشن اینڈ وی ہیو ڈاکٹر کے محمد ہیئر ہو از آور گیسٹ اسپیکر اینڈ شی از گوئنگ ٹو بی پریزینٹنگ آن ایچ آئی وی کے But before we actually proceed, I would like to actually focus on a hadith and narrate the hadith which states clearly that for every illness, there is a cure. It has also been narrated that our Prophet, peace be upon him, stated that our bodies are entrusted to us as an amanat and we should seek medical care and treatment for it. Um, Our Prophet, peace be upon him, also stated that physicians should be consulted in order to receive any kind of treatment and intervention. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Dr. K. Mohabit to introduce herself and give us some information on where she comes from. Assalamu alaikum, Shahida. Wa alaikum salam and welcome. Thank you so much. I work for an HIV NGO called Right to Care. I think it's the biggest NGO um, in South Africa. I'm based at Tembeletu Clinic, which is considered Right to Care's center of excellent, excellence that's based at Helen Joseph Hospital. Dr. K, I just wanted to hear with you, what are the latest developments in HIV? We're hearing a lot of stuff. We're hearing a lot of things from people out there, but in your expert in your field and area of expertise perhaps you can shed some light on the latest developments well I, i must say we're living in stunning times in this day and age firstly i have to say to everyone out there that hiv care is really really very simple it's all about testing and treatment and the treatment is so easy we're down to taking one tablet at night and like i say to all my patients how many times do you eat three times a day How many times do you brush your teeth? Two times a day. So asking anyone to pop one tablet at night when they go to bed is really very easy. And this is exactly where we are with HIV care right now. So where do you actually see it going to? I mean, what you're saying now is that it's no longer, what I'm hearing from you is that it's no longer a death certificate, uh, that it's people living with the illness. It's, it's not just people living with the illness, it's people having babies and having absolutely normal lives. It's like HIV is now in the past, end of story. That's exactly where we are right now. In fact, some days I think I run a fertility clinic more than an HIV clinic because everyone's having babies. So that's how stunning the field of medicine is with HIV care. So what you're saying is that HIV is a chronic illness? Absolutely. All you have to do is test and treat, and invariably, the sooner you test, the better, because you don't want to test when you're ill. If you test earlier and you start ARVs earlier, you will never, ever be ill. So the whole idea is to go out there, test, and start treatment immediately, and also remember, with time, the CD4 level is being upped. Presently, the state is using a CD4 of 350, but in private, Um, and private patients use a CD4-500, and that is not the only criteria one puts patients into care. If you find other clinical conditions that can put patients into care, like other forms of tuberculosis, um, and um, loss of weight and stuff like that, you can go into care even without the CD4, not only just that. Remember in a relationship, if you have one partner who's positive and one who's negative, The positive partner will start care irrespective of that CD4 as well. And all pregnant women get onto ARVs irrespective of their CD4s. Dr. K, what I would like to hear from you is how receptive are people in coming forward to accessing treatment, uh, counseling and support? It's a lot better now than it was in the past. Remember, we came in with the regime that had stigmatized the disease. Now it's not like that. The new regime is saying test and treat. So you still have people clutching onto the old ways of stigma and all of that. And I say to everyone, it's just in the past, really. So if you're not testing and treating, it comes from stupidity. So are you saying it's due to lack of 
information, lack of knowledge around the HIV care, um, that people are usually not coming forward because of the ignorance around these issues. Would you agree that that is probably what is contributing to the lack of uh, access or cooperation? I think it's uh, all the factors that you have mentioned. Um, um, one just has to get out there and test and treat and forget all the stigma. Because if you do test and treat, you will be able to access care immediately. So the failing shouldn't be yours. And if the failing is yours, then you have yourself to blame. So don't let us use stigma and the previous regime and I don't know. Just go out and test and treat. In your opinion, what message would you like to send out there to people in general around HIV care? Um, we're living in stunning times. You need to test and treat, and the treatment is down to one tablet at night. And even if that doesn't work for you, we will work around whatever you have. If you have TB, we will work around it. If you have liver problems, we will work around it. If you have kidney problems, we will work around it. If you're pregnant, we will work around it. So whatever you have, we can put you into care and make sure you are well and that you should live a pretty normal life. It's interesting, you seem to be focusing a lot on medical care, you speak about CD4 counts, you're talking about pill popping, but I'm not hearing, um, in, you know, with regard to the psychosocial support, accessing that, you know, where can people get that? Is that available? How easily accessible and available is psychosocial support? Psychosocial support is absolutely important. It is really important for people to know, firstly, to understand the illness, to understand the treatment, and to know that you can get other people there to support you. You must remember with HIV care, it's not just about the patient and the clinician. It goes beyond that. Social workers get involved, counsel work, counsel, counselors get involved, um, um, the physiotherapist gets involved. Um, we have a whole array of psychologists who get involved. And also we have um, um, networks where patients support each other. We have support groups happening. So you can also access the emotional care that will go with the HIV care as well. And all of that is important. You need to be motivated to continue with care. Because remember, this is treatment for the rest of your life. So even, you know, you, if, you, if you speak to your doctor and you can even say to him, are there other people I can chat to? And I'm sure he'll put you onto a support group. So are you saying, uh, well, firstly, I'm hearing that you're saying that multi-professionals are available and accessible. And at what cost or what are the cost implications for an average person out there who requires this kind of support? At right to care where I work, HIV care is for free. And I absolutely believe we provide these third world patients with total first world care. So we have a multidisciplinary approach. Even before you get to see the doctor, you see the counselors and you go through sessions there on wellness classes, adherence classes, readiness classes, so you understand your illness. You understand the drugs, you understand the side effects, so you are empowered into taking part and engaging in your care. And after you've done that, and all of that is done, then only are bloods pulled and whatever else, and there's a process before you even get to see the doctor. However, I have to say, I mustn't make it sound like the process takes forever. It doesn't take forever, and we also fast track patients, so it can happen in a day, but we prefer for it to happen over a week. If we can pause there, I would just like to focus, I like something that you said about the wellness program. And, uh, Looking at the wellness program, if we look at mothers uh, or, or pot potential would-be mothers, what advice would you give to them out there in terms of having babies and the implications of progression of the, the illness? To all mothers out there, all I have to say to you is test and treat. Once you've tested in treatment and you're on to treatment, remember you'll be on treatment for one of two reasons. You're going to be on treatment for yourself and you're going to be on treatment for your baby. 
And you must remember a couple of years ago, around about 2006, when I got into HIV care, we had 25% PMTCT rate, where one in four babies would be born HIV positive. And by putting mums into care, we've been able to bring that statistic down from 25% to 2%. So nowadays, no baby should be born with HIV. And the whole idea is just for the mothers to access care, whether they access care for the rest of their lives or for that short time that they, they are pregnant. So to all pregnant mothers out there, just test and treat. And once you've tested, you're on treatment, you can be absolutely certain your baby will be born HIV negative. So am I correct in understanding that mothers can have more than one child and they can continue to have children with, uh, with them being born without HIV? Absolutely. In fact, sometimes, like I said, I think I run a fertility clinic. I have um, um, mums and dads sitting there. I, I like to have them in as a couple, so you tell them what to do, how to do, when to do. And I have patients coming in with baby number two and three, and I've got to tell them now, slow it down. So all the mothers can go for it, but you need to be on treatment. Okay, so it is critical at all times that people need to continue with treatment. Those that are in treatment need to continue uh, and be diligent about treatment. The hallmark of HIV treatment is to take your treatment regularly. If you take your treatment regularly, you will absolutely do well. Okay. So it's all about just taking your treatment properly. And any other messages to the youth around HIV? To all the young men, I would say to them, you need to circumcise. If you circumcise, your chances of getting HIV are reduced by 60%. And I think the good old ways of, you know, abstinence, uh, faithfulness, and all of that, the good old values are still absolutely important. And if all of those good values fall away, then remember, you have to condomize. Well, I think it's important, alhamdulillah, what you're saying is so, so critical to our youth, to people out there is abstinence. That is leading a Sharia compliant lifestyle would certainly be a protective factor rather than a risk factor. And there are other risk factors which you could speak to and maybe you can elaborate a little bit on the risk factors that are looming out there. I think the youth of today need to understand that you have choices in life and you need to accept responsibility for what you do. And this is what life is about, you know, being responsible for what you do. So there's a time and place for everything and if you decide to shortcut that, you do pay the price for that. So whether it is with sexual activity or it is with drug use or whatever, you have to be responsible for what you do because there always is something that you will have to pay the price for. And what you're saying is so evident that actions have consequences um, and the, the, you know, the choices, people make choices and choices will result in, in, you know, in, in behaviors or outcomes that they may not always expect or anticipate. I run an adolescent clinic and I say to all the kids who come along to the clinic that, you know, everything happens in stages. You start walking when you're one year old and you talk when you're two years old. So likewise, when you're a teenager, you know, go with the opportunities afforded to you education wise. Once you've sorted that out and you have a career on hand and then you have a wider variety and choice in life. But if you short circuit that, then you will pay the price. And to parents out there, Dr. K, what would you like to say to parents out there? I think you've got to make your kids as knowledgeable as possible. Um, don't think it happens to other people. So you have to empower everyone, kids, adults, with an education and with knowledge. And what you're saying, knowledge is power. Power liberates people. And I think on that note, we will take an ad break now. We are back here with uh, Health Matters on behalf of the Islamic Medical Association with Dr. K. Mohammed. Dr. K, I would just like to focus a little bit on lifestyle, looking at nutrition, looking at uh, exercise, the diet, and anything that you can speak to lifestyle. Lifestyle is absolutely important with HIV care. And the reason lifestyle is so important, remember when you're starting out with ARVs, you generally are a sicker patient. 
And when you're sicker, your body needs a lot more energy than it does when you are well. And the funny thing is nowadays with patients being so well, starting ARVs a lot earlier and being on ARVs, after a while you've got to tell patients you need to watch what you eat. You don't need the same amount of energy you needed before. Also, some of the drugs do cause um, an alteration in your cholesterol levels and we have to send patients to the dietitian mm. to teach them about weight loss as opposed to weight gain when we're starting patients on treatment and all about eating healthy and eating clever. Oh. So um, a, a, um, a diet is absolutely important. And other, other issues around lifestyle, Dr. K, that you can shed some light on and give, provide some advice on? Like I say to our HIV patients now, we're doing really well. You're as normal as anyone else is, and you've got to do the same things everyone else wants if you want to live a good old life. So you've got to exercise, and you've got to work on your stress levels and lead a good life. And what you're saying is actually touches a chord when you talk about managing stress levels. How should people actually address the issue of stress? Because we're surrounded by stress all the time. You've got to seek help if you need to see a psychologist, if you need to see a social worker, if you need to speak to your physician, you need to do what you need to do if you need to see a psychiatrist. If taking a walk does it for you, if playing golf does it for you, if having a swim does it for you, whatever works for you, you need to do. And if you need any more help, you need to call for help. So, of course, what you're saying is that one needs to look after oneself, access any kind of support in terms of uh, exercise, anger management, to address the stress levels in whatever form it takes to help one. We would like to also announce that we are going to be taking calls now, and the number to call is 011-086-7701. I repeat, 011-086-7701. 7701. Please feel free to call in so that your questions can be answered and advice can be provided to you. Coming back to, you mentioned something about tuberculosis, TB. What can you speak to uh, uh, that? I, I must say, not only has HIV care been so advanced, but we've also brought TB on board. I mean, previously, if you were symptomatic of TB, it took about six weeks before a diagnosis was made. And nowadays, we have a machine that is called the Gene Expert. And we can tell you in two hours, not just whether you have TB or not, but even whether the drugs we give you will be fine for you or not, whether you're drug sensitive to that. So I think the TB world has gained extensively with the HIV and not just when you go to any TB facility, you have HIV testing done at the same time. When you come in for an HIV test, every time you see a doctor, we ask you for symptoms of TB as well. And it's like a, a, a screening that consists of asking patients a few questions. Are you losing weight? Are you coughing? Do you have night sweats? So every time you see your HIV doctor, he will make sure that you are TB screened as well. So you just, you know, you benefit both ways. Okay, we have, we are going to take a call now. We have a caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Maimuna. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Maimuna, I think you have your television set on. Please can you switch that off so that we can get a better reception and respond to you appropriately? Okay, I'll do that. Shukran. Afwan. Uh, I would like to the doctor to explain to me uh, about psoriasis. So you would like to, the doctor to speak to you about psoriasis? Yes, yes. Dr. K? Psoriasis is a skin condition, and I would prefer for you to address like HIV-related issues if possible. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, shukran. Okay, okay. I would also like to just urge the viewers to remember to call in with 
questions that are related specifically to HIV care. Uh, Dr. K would be willing to support and advise anything related to HIV care. We now have another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salaikum salam. How, may, how can we help you? Yes, uh, I would like to ask a question regarding breastfeeding. If um, I'm HIV positive and I'm breastfeeding, and then maybe somebody asked me to put my milk in, in the eye of a baby, can that baby be affected with HIV? All right, if you have HIV, the mainstay of treatment, remember, is to make sure you take your treatment properly. If you take your treatment properly, what we're looking at is the viral load. And for as long as you're virally suppressed, which means you have undetectable viral levels, the chances of you transmitting HIV to any baby, whether, you know, into the eye, I'm not even sure why you would want to put breast milk into a baby's eye, by breastfeeding the baby for as long as the mother is virally suppressed, she doesn't have virus to transmit to the baby. So it is absolutely crucial for all mothers to understand that you have to be on treatment and you have to make absolutely certain you're taking your treatment properly and you're virally suppressed. And if you do that, then your baby is fine. The other thing I also need to let you know that what we suggest in the first six months, you must exclusively breast or bottle feed. Do not mix feeds in the first six months as well. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Are you satisfied? Yes, I'm happy. Okay. Shukran. Okay. Um, Dr. K. For people out there, I, I mean, there's a stigma that has been ongoing and attached and associated with HIV and even the HIV care. What is your response to that? I'm going to say to everyone out there, let's forget the stigma and let's forget the past. Let's act like really smart and educated people and all of us should test and treat. Because only if you test do you know whether you're HIV positive or not. And if you are, you can access care. And you can access care before you get ill and you can live an absolutely normal life. What would you say to the fact that there's often when there's, uh, you know, when there's a person discovers their HIV status, there's usually naming, shaming, blaming. And, and how does one actually respond to that kind of situation? Because there's total denial, there's shock and denial. One goes through the whole Kubler-Ross model of the grieving and the mourning uh, process. How does one actually deal with it? It is very, very difficult. And the reason I say it is very difficult, I see this in the practice all the time, where um, sometimes you have uh, uh, one partner being positive, the other being negative, people questioning who, what, why, when. And what I kind of prefer is to have both the people in at the same time. So whatever fears or anxiety whoever has can be discussed with both of them in front of you and um, sometimes people um, are more open and are quite willing to listen to the doctor so if you find it a little hard do it with your doctor it'll be a lot easier with the doctor who then can explain to the both of you the ifs and the buts and the whys so I would say Chat to your doctor about it. If you're still very unhappy, you can be referred to a counselor. If you're still unhappy there, you can be referred to a psychologist. But between the doctor, the counselor, and the psychologist, and even the social worker, all of this will be discussed, and all the issues and stigma and whatever will be ironed out. But the, the, the thing about HIV care is all about taking medicines and taking them correctly. We would just like to appeal to callers to call in on this topic of HIV care, and the number to call is 011-086-7701. And the number is on the screen, so people, please look at the number and feel free to contact Dr. K on Health Matters on behalf of the Islamic Medical Association. You were saying that Using a, a, a therapeutic or a, a health professional as a therapeutic alliance to, 
to create that medium of safety. How well has that worked? I mean, if we're looking at the Muslim community from the Islamic perspective and people not having led a Sharia compliant lifestyle, how has that actually translated into disclosing their status? Personally, I don't think anyone can judge another. Indeed, and I would like to say, I would like to quote an ayah from the Quran. Allah um, is the best of judges and Allah knows best. And I think that is something that we all need to remember at all times. And you know the famous line, trust the doctor, trust him. He'll always put you on the right route. So see your HIV clinician, see your GP, see your physician, test and treat. Okay, and so are we getting this message repeatedly from Dr. K? It's about test and treat. It's not about dying. It's actually living with the illness. And she says living with the chronic illness. So that is something I think people need to take back and, and actually be diligent on and continue the treatment. I, um, I, you know, these days I go, what dying? This is exactly where we are. So what dying are we talking about? We have life, it's a gift we have, and I think we need to treasure it. So if you are ill, seek care and you will get well. And this is the thing with HIV care. I mean, you sometimes see patients are um, at the start of care and they're not well, and a month later you can barely even recognize them. They look so well. And uh, Shida, I have to share a few stories with you. I. Uh, also run like a, like a disability clinic. When I mean disability, I mean some of the patients are like blind. And uh, for whatever reason, I mean, these patients lead normal lives. So, I mean, the one couple I, I can um, quote um, um, run the comrades. And I always go, Richard, how do you do it? And he says, Kay, I run it with my ears. So... Uh, and, and I mean, those are some of the success stories that you're sharing with us. And what you're actually saying is that there is life beyond HIV. There's not just life beyond HIV. I've just had another patient who was beaming from one ear to the other. And I went, wow, did your wife get pregnant? He said, yes, with triplets. So you can see. Okay, and on that note, we had a caller who has uh, actually asked a question around the delivery that being, uh, uh, you know, having, uh, being pregnant and having a baby, uh, will that result in a normal delivery or does it require a C-section, a cesarean section? All right, remember the mainstay of HIV treatment is treatment. So if you're on ARVs and you're doing well, unless you have an obstetrical indication for a cesarean section, um, in the government sector, you will deliver vaginally, and there shouldn't be any risks there as well. So you don't really, a C-section is no indication with HIV care at all. So there's no risk of uh, patients being subjected to a C-section? Now, you will have a C-section if there's an indication, but the indication is obstetrical. It is not HIV. Okay, so it's not HIV-related. No, it's not HIV-related in the, in the government sector. We urge callers to call in on this line, 011-086-7701 on Health Matters, and the topic is HIV care. Dr. K, you, you said you had, some, you, know, you had a few success stories. Perhaps you can share some more success stories so people can actually see that actually there's a lot more to offer and, and contributions to make, even if one is subjected to this chronic illness? Shada, I don't even know where to start. It is just such a wonderful field of medicine to be in right now. Um, sometimes my, my kids complain and I go, how can I not do what I do? I save lives, I make people well, and I, can I tell you, they are just so well, it's unbelievable. I, I, like I said, I just don't know where to start. In terms of um, 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 uh, p women falling pregnant, I say to them, this is how you do it, and I can be absolutely certain within two or three months, they're all back there beaming to say, Dr. K, we're pregnant now. I have uh, um, 
um, patients who walk into the rooms and they have such severe peripheral neuropathy, they can barely even walk. As they walk in, you can see there's a problem. You put them onto ARVs and within a month, they are walking properly. Mm. You see other patients who previously might have had the older drugs we use that had side effects and we've now changed their drugs and their weight loss, their body changes, all of that is in the past. And like I say, previously you had a ton load of pills to take and now you're just taking one tablet at night. So the success, success stories just go on and on and on. Now hearing your success stories, I just have some reservations around that. My concern is uh, what message are we giving to people out there um, that you know, it's okay to, to, uh, to be subjected to risky behavior uh, because there's, there's a cure for it. So people can go out and engage in risky behavior because at the end of it, they can still continue to lead this successful life as you've illustrated. I uh, wish you hadn't asked me that one. <laughs> I must say that I really don't want anyone to engage in risky behavior because like I say, you will pay the price for that risky behavior. But uh, what I'm saying is if you now have HIV, we can make sure you will read it, lead a normal life. But all I'm saying is it's not just about risky behavior, it's about safe sex as well. And I think just when we began the program, uh, narrating one of the hadiths that our body is an amanat that is entrusted to us to take care of, and failure to take care of that is actually committing a sin. I would like to appeal to people out there, the viewers, the number to call in on is 011-086-7701. Um, Shada, I just want to also say that lots of um, children are born with HIV if they've got it from their mums as well. Mother to child transmission. The mother to child transmission from the old days. And uh, remember that in the old days, um, there were certain criteria that was met before you were put into ARV care and now um, if you're less than five years old, irrespective of your CD4, whatever, you will go into HIV care immediately. So you can see, you know, the government's got a program that's just stepping up better health care all the time, especially in the HIV world. I must say I'm absolutely impressed. When I started doing HIV care in 2006, uh, the government had just started rolling out ARVs. At that time, the ARVs were given twice a day. There were lots of tablets, and they were tablets with side effects. And now we've like moved it all to tablets at night. And then now it's not just three tablets at night, it's just one tablet at night. So I mean, I think it's, you know what I mean, a, a wonderful space we're in right now with HIV care. I want to ask you a question around HIV. Is it confined to any specific population group? Absolutely not. Um, I say to everyone, you're HIV positive until you've proven that you're HIV negative. So everyone is HIV positive unless you've done the test and you now know you're HIV positive and then you, you do the test. And if the test says you're negative, that is fine. And that's the way everyone must think. Let's test and then treat. Don't make the assumption, oh, only some people get it and not other people. Because the thing about the virus, it knows no borders. It knows no race. It knows no gender. And I think what Dr. K is saying is, you know, it occurs across the spectrum and nobody can be exempted from this because there are other risk factors that can contribute to this illness of HIV. Uh, we had another caller on the line who has requested to actually know the physical location of your hospital and, and service that you provide. Where are you based? All right, I work at Tembeletu Clinic, which is a HIV clinic, which is run by Right to Care and we're based at Helen Joseph Hospital. And to everyone out there, I must say, we render free service and we have no borders. We will see you from wherever you come. Whether you're from South Africa or Sudan, we really couldn't care because we know the, the virus has no borders, so no do we, and we've always treated all patients fairly. So what you're saying is the criteria for admission is not based on any form of payment? The criteria for treatment is based on your illness only. We do not accept any money for HIV care. 
And not only do you get uh, ARVs, but you also have free pap smears and you will have free circumcisions as well. So we do the whole package for you. We will test you, we will treat you, we will counsel you. We will send you to the social worker. We will organize a grant for you. We will organize food parcels for you. We will circumcise you. We will do your pap smears for you. And this is all for free. So this um, is while I'm here, I just want to also mention that uh, the clinic I work at uh, is very automatic, uh, automated. We have a, a, a row of machine that even dispenses the medicine. So the time that you have to wait in the clinic is also very short. We have doctors in large numbers working there. There really are no queues. All patient records are computerized. So it's really, uh, I think, the most stunning treatment anyone could want to get ever. Okay, it sounds like a first world service in the third world country. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we will now take an ad break. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. We are back on Health Matters, uh, focusing on HIV care with Dr. K. Mohammed. Please, people out there, to all the listeners, feel free to contact us on 011-086-7701. Dr. K., just in terms of treatment, what new developments have been made in terms of perhaps radical interventions and treatment regarding HIV? All right, firstly, I said we're now on to the fixed drug combination of giving patients instead of three drugs, just one drug. That's the first thing. And the second thing is we can work around anything. If you have kidney disease, if you've got TB, if you have hepatic disease, if you've got cardiac disease, we'll dose adjust and give you what drugs work best for you. Aside from that, remember now that um, the epidemic is, you know, uh, we've had it for a while now, and we have, if you fail your first regimen, which is a treatment we give you when you start for whatever reason, we have new drugs available for the second regimen. And even if you fail the second regimen, we have absolutely new drugs available now for regimen three, which previously we call salvage therapy, but now we're not even referring to regimen three as salvage therapy because we have new drugs available and the patients are doing really well on the new drugs. We um, do a resistance test on patients and on that we decide what drugs to give them and not give them. And we've seen the success stories even there that patients we're putting onto newer drugs are now doing so well and are virally suppressed on the new drugs. So what you're saying is that you're not using a one size fits all, that you are actually tailor, tailor making it to the needs and requirements of the patient. I don't think there are very many illnesses can, that, that can respond to care like HIV has, and I think the HIV world has done just that. They've done the absolute best for their patients. You know, and I must admit that I, 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 I feel very happy that the government has been um, the backbone of HIV care and the Minister of Health has come on board and promoted um, best practice. Alhamdulillah, that so much investment and effort has been put into the treatment of HIV patients. Um, you know, right now, the kind of patients coming in are patients with higher CD4s. Um, we are, you know, treating a um, TB a lot earlier as well. We're picking up cancer of the cervix a lot earlier as well. And I think it's just a matter of time this ep epidemic will make a turnaround. I am absolutely convinced that it's just a matter of time and the epidemic will make a turnaround. Um, though I have to say that it is our teenagers and our youngsters we now need to let know that you are the kids who can decide whether you want the illness or not and rather not then do. And, and that is my next question to you. You speak about so much about care, so it's, it's reacting to the symptoms and I would like to look at how can we prevent this before it becomes symptomatic. Now, like I said, I mean, the, the Minister of Health and, and, and the HIV world is advocating circumcisions. 
So to all the men out there, please get circumcised. You, the chances of your getting HIV is going to be reduced by 60%. To all girls out there, remember that like you get pregnant, you're going to get HIV. So delay all of that for as long as you can. Pursue an education, look into a career first. There will be plenty of time for what needs to be done when the time is right. But do empower yourself with an education, with the career first. And when the time is right, things will happen. And if you do need to practice sex, remember it's all about safe sex. But I think it's important to emphasize from a Sharia perspective, we're speaking and make reference to abstinence. And I think that is what we need to emphasize out there, rather, uh, rather abstinence, because we know that actions have consequences and these are huge risk factors that have huge implications on one's not only physical being, well-being, but also psychological well-being. And I know you're coming from a medical perspective of cure and living with the illness, but we're on, one also needs to look at how we can prevent this and how we can actually cure people from engaging in this kind of risky behavior or contracting this kind of illness and having to undergo uh, chronic medical treatment and, and go through the process of accessing psychosocial support, so, support. I think there are so many challenges that are attached to this. I mean, there's also negative connotations that are attached to it. And as much as there's a lot of good work and goodwill by the medical fraternity, there are also uh, the ills, the social ills that people have to live with. And I think that is something that one needs to propagate and, and send messages out to our children. Uh, for sure. I mean, life is a gift. And we need to realize that life is a gift. And we need to treasure the gift. So to everyone out there, life is a gift. And if you have to make choices, you're going to have to make them. And you will pay the price for that. So do remember that whatever you do, you will have to pay the price for. So if you are educated and intelligent about what you do, you will make the right choice. And uh, it's not just about uh, sexual relations these days. Remember, drug abuse is also indeed, on the up. Indeed. So to all the drug abusers as well, you're also at high risk of un contracting HIV. So do be aware of that if you are a drug abuser. It's just a matter of time as well. Again, I mean, you, you raised the issue of substance abuse. So we're talking specifically about drug abuse and a lot of peer pressure and social belonging gravitating towards uh, groups in order to receive recognition, approval, affection. And I think this pulls me into the direction of the role and responsibility of parents, often children because of their own inadequacies, uh, low self-esteem, reach out to their peers for this kind of recognition. And this is a huge risk factor. And I think this is where one needs to engage parents uh, in reaching out to their children, in communicating with their children. Shida, I think it's not just the parents, hey? It's the friends you keep that is very, very, very important. I have four of my own kids, and I know how hard it is as a parent to parent properly, and you try your best as a parent, but I think the friends you keep also play a huge influence in your life. So, you know, the friends you keep are absolutely important as well. Uh, what you're saying is all interactions, all interpersonal relations are critical in the tra trajectory or course of development of a child. And I think, again, I know you say not only the parents, but then the parents do have a huge responsibility and role to play in, uh, in actually ensuring and, and making sure that they know who their children are associating with, who their children's friends are, where are their children going to. Children often say they're going to the cinema, to the movies, and, and, and end up elsewhere. So I think these are kind of things where parents need to befriend their children. They need to develop some kind of relationship where there's openness, honesty, but also uh, limit setting that there are structures in place to ensure that safety measures are put in place. 
I must also say, Shaira, it's a lot harder these days than it used to be. You know, I think in the past it was a lot easier. These days with cell phones and the technology the kids are, you know, accessible to also makes things a little harder. Most definitely. I think the social media and the dangers lurking out there, um, all the cyber bullying and the sexting that goes on, um, and also I think the explicit sexual scenes and... Uh, the, 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 the in impressions that are created by the media, it sensationalizes, eroticizes uh, drug taking, uh, risky behaviors, and often children are actually very impressionable and influenced by this, and which can result in them internalizing this and assimilating this in their behavioral repertoire because uh, they feel there's a sense of grandiosity attached to this. And they identify with celebrity figures and icons and what they see on the movies is what they want to live out there. They want to reenact what they've been exposed to. But also children, I mean, if we look at behavior, it's rooted in learning theory. They learn by what they love. No, but y you must remember that nowadays, um, when we grew up, I mean, you went to school and perhaps to madrasa, and then you came home and did your homework and you read books. The kids of today don't read, they watch TV. And God forbid, sometimes when I have a look at what the kids are watching, I'm horrified. So they're exposed to a whole lot of new stuff these days. And uh, I don't know, for better or for worse, one needs to be very careful with kids these days. And, and the, the, my response to that is communication, communication, communication. Um, tough love. Uh, love your children to, and, and mother your children. Don't smother them, but also know everything about your child, it's critical. In wrapping up, I think it's important if we just, you know, summarize what you said earlier about HIV care, about that there is life beyond HIV, the treatment, and then where you are based. If you can just give that kind of information, once again, t to the listeners out there, to the viewers, so that they can, if for people that have come on late onto the program. All right, I work for an NGO, Call Right to Care. We based at Helen Joseph Hospital. The HIV clinic is called the Tembeletu Clinic. However, I also wish to let you know, Shida, that the government has rolled out HIV care to all the clinics. We now have HIV care not just in the hands of the NGOs, not just in the hands of a few doctors. HIV care has been rolled out to all the clinics as well. So you should be able to access ARVs at all of your local clinics. The nurses are now upscaling HIV care as well. So it's not like I can get treatment here and not there and I gotta travel here and there wherever, no. Just go to your local clinic and you will find that ARV care is being rolled out there. And we can, it's very evident to us because in the, when I started out, we would see an average of about 800 patients a day. But ever since the government has rolled out HIV care, we find that um, we're seeing an average of about 400 patients a day. So you can access care at your local clinic. Thank you, Dr. K. I think that's been very useful information and val valuable to the, the viewers out there and, and that there is, uh, there is treatment for HIV. There is life that people don't have to die or it's not a death certificate. In concluding, I would like to just read Surah Al-Asr. Wal-Asri inna al-insana lafi khus illa alladhina Amanu wa amilis solihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabri. Surakallahu lazim. I would just like to also remind all the viewers out there that next week the topic is going to be on matters of the heart, literally and figuratively. We are going to have Dr. Farooq Mamdu, he who is a specialist and who is going to be speaking on heart diseases. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And thank you to Dr. K. Mohammed for being such an excellent guest. Thank you.